afternoon, everyone. How are you today? I'm glad that you all speak English. I still can remember some English. Good. It's very nice to be here. It's an honor to be here to share some things with you about this great subject from ideas into actually action and reality. I'd like to share with you some of the things that I've observed and some of the things that I've gone through in turning a certain idea into something that becomes a reality and a product. So there's a lot of ideas out in the world today. We all know that. So many ideas. Everybody said, why don't they do this? Why don't they make something? Ideas improve the world. They make the world a better place, don't they? You think so? Let's have some hui in there, huh? You think I do? Okay, I thought that's good. You understand? I think so. Okay. But you know, ideas, good ideas, are really good. They make a big difference. But sometimes when people talk about these ideas, there's so many of them, and they say, well, why doesn't somebody do this? Why doesn't somebody do that? But if you go up to them and say, why don't you? Oh, me? Oh, no, you know, I'm too busy. I mean, I can't do it. You know? And whenever you have an idea, and they say, why doesn't somebody? And you think about it, it's going to involve three important things that I'd like you to remember. And we can just say them all together today. Three things that are involved in having an idea become a reality. The first one is what? Time. Let's say that, time. Time. It's time. Yeah, right, it's time. And it takes action. You have to do something about it. Number two. Action. And money. That's true. If you have a good idea, it's going to take a lot of your time. It's going to take you doing something. And it's probably going to take some money. Those three things. Let's say them again. Time. Action. Money. Eight plus. <laughs> well, you know, when I was uh, younger, a long, long time ago, in fact, way back in 1948, before, before most of you were even born, right? I got on a ship in Seattle, my hometown, and went with some people in the agency to come out to Asia to try to make a difference. Now, when I was growing up, all over the United States, they would challenge young people, go and help people in Africa and China and these developing countries. They need some help. Who will go and help them? So, okay, by the time I'd finished my school and university, I said, I will go to Asia. And it was a long way to Asia on a boat in those days. No fast airplanes, take weeks to get there. But when I got here, I found that it was such a different world. In fact, Asia, any country in Asia today, whether it's Taiwan or China or any country, is quite different than it was when I first came here. You could probably hardly even imagine it, really. And I found that the people were all more into the agricultural society. Everybody, you know, was trying to figure out some way to make a living, and there were lots of problems that needed people to help them solve. They had a lot of needs. There were sanitary needs. Um, there, were, there was a lot of dysentery around, and kids were dying from that. They didn't have medicine from it. And there were a lot of mosquitoes, and we had to sleep under mosquito nets. I don't know if any of you have ever slept under a mosquito net, have you? Probably not. Anyway, we had to because of malaria and things like that. And we'd go out and have some nice Chinese noodles in a nice little restaurant. But the waiters sometimes were lepers and had part of their fingers gone. They didn't have any place for them at that time. It was a very different world than you know right now. And there were lots of different needs for people in different ways. And there were also needs for, you could say, spiritual needs. People were trying to find out what life is all about and what they could do to improve themselves. There were educational needs. I was more involved in children's kind of work and in musical work and children's choirs and and all kinds of different things, not English. In those days, it was not about English. But there were so many different kinds of needs. And as the country was changing here from 1950s to 1960s, 
great big changes were going on. Asia, and Taiwan especially, and all of them, were changing from agricultural nations into industrialized nations. And this was a very, very big change. And so America sent out different organizations. They sent out um, American Guantan, and they sent JCRR. One group that really helped a lot was a group that was called the International Executive Service Corps. They taught people how to run their factories and how to operate businesses and, and how to be more international. All these things were coming out here to help. That was great. But that created another big need. The idea they needed to have English to communicate because they spoke English and people here were not speaking much English in those days. And so there was a big need for English at that period of time. And so we thought, well, what are we going to do about this need? And I would often be at gatherings when people would get together with, Amer with uh, Americans like Time Magazine, and they would interview the people in the government, and those people always had an interpreter with them because they couldn't speak that much English. They were afraid they'd say the wrong thing, so they would hire interpreters. But the trouble was, the interpreters didn't have very good English either. <laughs> and that was kind of a big problem. And I remember one time, it was really very embarrassing. I was in a, a big meeting with officials and these magazines were interviewing. They said, is Taiwan really an independent free country? And the interpreter said the wrong thing. He said, no. <gasps> What's to say yes? But he said, no. And even the person listening, you know, didn't really realize. I said, look it. You cannot count on your interpreters. You're going to have to learn your own English. You cannot have interpreters. You have to learn to speak for yourself. And so there was this great need. And then people said, well, who can help us do this? And I was approached many times, would I help in teaching English? I thought, teaching English. If my English teachers in America knew I was going to teach English out here, they would say, oh, no. Because that wasn't my favorite subject, really. You know, I like things like band and, and uh, music and, oh, uh, you know, tennis, uh, everything, not English, okay. But there was a big need for English. And since I spoke English, and that was my native language, I thought about it. And I thought, well, maybe if I could help. But then I thought about these three things, and it came up again. It was going to take time. I was already teaching music at the Goyen Street, and I was teaching music, I was doing many things. I wasn't teaching English, but there was a need for English. So I thought, well, it is going to take time, and you're going to have to do something about it. And so I talked to the people in the company that we were working for, and we decided, yes, that we should help meet this need. Because we came here to help with the needs of what people needed, not what we wanted to do. You know, like play tennis or play my trumpet. That's not what they needed. They needed English. So I said, OK, we'll help do English. But when I thought about teaching English, I thought, they don't need to know things like, you know, this is a table, this is a chair, and this kind of thing. And they didn't need to know all the rules of grammar. You could buy a grammar book. They were taught some kind of English in the school, but people couldn't use English. They didn't understand what people were saying. They couldn't communicate in English. So we thought, OK, if we're going to help do this, how can we help all the people? If I'm just in Taipei, and I helped the people in Taipei. What about all around the island? They needed English every place. And so I thought, radio. Ah, radio is the way. Radio is the way to reach everybody, not just a few people in just a, an English class. And if we have a radio program, it's going to have to be about something important that people need to know. So we thought about current topics, things that they needed to know in order to develop to improve the conditions that we needed to improve in those days. So we thought, well, we'll print out little lesson sheets, and everybody can come to our place, it's like a studio, and we'll record the message, and we'll talk about the subject. Everybody will come. We'll call it Studio Classroom. And people can come at 6 o'clock in the morning, very early on bicycles, by the way, right? <laughs> 6 o'clock, and people would come from businesses, housewives, students would come. There's students today who said when they were in high school many, many years ago, they used to go there at very early in the morning and record the program. And they would ask the questions. We had the lesson sheet, and they would ask the things they didn't know. Instead of us just teaching, teaching, they would want to 
know what they needed to find out. So we called it Studio Classroom. We recorded the program, but then the money part came in. We wanted to get it on more stations and more people. So we got on BCC, the Broadcasting Corporation, Zhongguang. I don't know why. Every morning at 6 o'clock, people could hear Studio Classroom. All over the island. All kinds of people listened in. And people then, the studio had to get a little bit bigger and more people came. And they came to find out how to use English in their life. So not just to learn English, but how to use English. In fact, we often had very famous guests, like Dr. Lin Yutang. Lin Yutang had come back to Taiwan because he wanted to come back to his country and repay. He'd been in America quite a few years, and he came back to help the schools and write English textbooks. So Lin Yutang said, would I please read his books for the English for the school? I said, okay, I'll read your books if you come to my program. So Lin Yutang came and was on studio classroom, and students could relate to him. He was a very interesting person, and they liked talking to him. And then other guests came from the American Executive Corps, people that were head of big corporations, and they would come and share what they knew about office management, about any, any different subject. These people would come to the studio, and then we decided we had to spend more money. We had to be on more stations, and we had to be on at noon and at night, because some people couldn't hear it in the morning. So pretty soon, we were on several different networks, and the lesson sheets, uh, got to be from, you know, from basic to junior to senior, three different levels, three magazines, three programs. Wow, it became really a big thing, student classroom, all over the island, really, in those days. And so then we thought, well, that's good. We're, we're reaching a lot of people, but there's still a lot of things involved in this, not just teaching people. And when you, when you get into something that, that you find that there are things that come along that you didn't even think about. People want to hear more things. They want to hear it on TV. And they want to hear it different ways. So we thought, why don't we do a little bit more? But there's always a risk involved. A risk. What kind of a risk? Well, one of the risks is there always are kind of risks involved. And you can easily get sidetracked. Because we were printing three magazines, color magazines. And they were just beginning to get colored printing presses in time. Why didn't we start a printing company? Why don't we do this? Why don't we? And pretty soon, you can get sidetracked. So you forget what you're trying to do. So you have to be careful when you have a project that you don't get sidetracked. You're doing so many things that you forget what your main point is. So we said, OK, we won't do that. We'll do something else. And we tried to get advertisers to pay for the radio, but we kept on with the teaching, the part that people needed to know. But there were other forces, too. There were external forces that came in from the outside. There always are. One of them was the competition. Oh, this program, everybody's listening to, everybody's buying the magazine, we're going to do the same thing. And pretty soon you have a lot of competitors. And then sometimes they would try to make their magazine cheaper or do something else so people would buy theirs instead of ours. And you know, you could say, let's cut corners. Let's put the quality down. Not, not use such expensive paper. Not use such good uh, CDs and things for them. But no, we said, let's keep on the quality. And you can use competitors as something to challenge you to do better, instead of letting it get you down. It's an outside force competition, but it can help you, can challenge you to do something even better than your competitors are doing. One other outside force is something that's with all of us, no matter what we do. It's constant changes. Do you find out things are changing all the time? Every day, every minute, things are changing. And these changes, are things like, if you could see, technology. Do you think technology is changing? Not every month, almost every day. Technology is changing. Lifestyles are changing. People don't want to read a big, long lesson. They want a short lesson. They want to hear it uh, on a DVD or a CD-ROM. The way they listen is different. And their economy is different. So we always have to deal with these three things. Technology, lifestyle, and economics. You have to keep up with all the merchant technologies, or your work will probably just disappear. 
And then people said, well, why, why won't we on TV? Okay, TV, you know, who knows how to make TV? TV just started in 1962 in Taiwan. So, okay, we'll put the program on TV because people want to learn on TV. And DVDs, and then magazines, and then all the things that you have today that we have to keep up with. We have to develop, use these different means to reach people. But in the midst of all of this, when you're doing something a long period of time, so your classroom just had their 50th year anniversary, you have to keep one thing with it, and that's passion. If you don't keep passion in your work, if it just becomes a daily drudge, then it will lose its charm, and it will people will not listen anymore. You have to care about the people. You don't just make a magazine and hope they're going to buy it. Or you don't listen to this program, send an ad. No, you have to care about meeting the needs. And the needs of the people change. So you have to change. Your content's change. The way you teach, everything has to change. And if you don't have any passion, you'll soon say, oh, forget it, that's too much. I always thought, you know, we'd probably teach English for a few years, and after that, nobody would need English anymore. Oh, for a few years, you still need English, right? And the language needs to be more and more. I just came back from Europe, and people all over Europe, Chinese people that have moved to Spain and Paris, and they said, would you come and help us with English? I said, well, we live in Italy, why do we need English? We all need English. So the need for English didn't change. So we have to keep up reaching out to people. And actually, um, everybody communicates. You can communicate in any way you want to, but if you don't connect with people, then your product will not last very long. And there's a book that says, it's a very good book, I don't know if you've read it, it's by John Maxwell, it says, everyone communicates, but few connect. There's always people communicating, telling you that what you don't listen doesn't mean anything to you. When you communicate, you have to connect. And when you're teaching, you have to connect. When you're in business, when you're selling a product, you might have a very great product, but nobody knows about it. They don't know how to use it. So these are things that we all have to think about when we are doing something that is an idea, that has become a reality. We have to communicate. We have to connect with people, wherever they are. And another thing is that we have to find out ways of doing this. And we found that in Studio Classroom, to connect with people all over the world, that we had to use media more. And not only radio and TV, but all these other forms that, that we have today. And we found that people in China were listening in. And I met people in America and other countries, and they were from China. In fact, I just met a man recently, let's see, from some other country, I guess it was over in Spain, who was just there recently. And he brought me all the things that I studied Studio Classroom for 10 years in Shanghai. You did? Okay, I wasn't in Shanghai, but he studied studio classroom there. So all over the world, we are spreading all over the world. So you have to get your idea around, and you have to use modern media to really make it useful to people. And it's very interesting to get letters from people and emails now from people in Dubai and people that are uh, from another nationality, and they will say, they will call me Mother Doris, and they, Mother Doris, tell it, I just uh, said on your TV in, in Dubai. And we've had our magazine in Mozambique, in Portuguese, and all over the world, because we try to connect with people, we try to meet the needs of the people, and keep up with what is going on. And so Studio Classroom now, it's gone all over the world to so many different countries. And we don't want to just teach people how to speak English. There's no real value in that. But how to use English. How to make English something that will improve their life. So the idea of teaching English was not just to teach it like a subject, but was like to use it to improve people's lives, to do the things they need. In fact, there was one, one farmer, uh, I think we had a picture of him just a minute ago. He, he was out in the field listening to the classroom. Another man that was doing pineapple research up in the Taichung area, and he was just a farmer. But the uh, executive course said, we need to send somebody to Hawaii to learn how to can pineapple. We need to learn how to do that. And all the people said, well, we can't speak English. How can we go to Hawaii? So they chose this man who didn't have a very high education, but he had good English. He listened in every day to the studio classroom, every day and every night. 
And they chose him, and he went to Hawaii and learned how to do that and came back for Typhoon Pineapple and became one of their executives. Wow, isn't that amazing? So if you use things that are really going to help people in their lives, then it will make a difference. Then the product that you have is worthwhile. Your ideas have become a reality in people's lives. And so using English is not as you know, something like just learning it. I learned a lot of English. You can learn it, but you have to be able to listen. You have to be able to know the culture. When we first taught it, people didn't know about uh, supermarkets and freeways. They didn't have them, but they learned the culture. And one lady in the United States uh, came out here and she said, I'm from a, a college, a university, and the students that come to my school all say, I learned my English at Studio Classroom. She said, what is Studio Classroom? Because the Chinese students from Taiwan that come, they're always good in English because they can learn how to use it. So if you want to use your English, that's more important than just learning it. So today, I hope you're going to use it and talk to each other in English afterwards, but English is a tool for communication. And actually, it has to change like everything changes around the world. I'd like to just show you how Studio Classroom has changed through the years to become what it is today. Studio Classroom not only wants to help you learn English, but we want to help you know how to use English in your life. And we want to be your friend for life. And remember that all ideas need action, and they need focus, and they need passion. So keep your passion in everything you do. And I'd like to close with a quotation from former President of the United States, John Kennedy. He said, a man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives on. So believe in your ideas, they will live on, and they will help make this world a better place for all of you. Thank you.